revelations that he claims to experience, which lead him to, in effect, create the third of the monotheistic Abrahamic religions, and that is Islam, a religion that, after some initial inertia, you might say, some initial struggles in the first few years for Muhammad to gain a following, um, and after sort of pivotal event, really experiences a, a meteoric rise as a religion. And within just a few generations is a re religion that is at the heart of a state spanning across the Middle East and the Levant and into Egypt and eventually into southeastern Europe and across North Africa and into Spain. And when I say a religion at the heart of a state, that's an important thing to keep in mind here. We've seen in other places and times up to this point where a religion can reinforce the rule of a state. But here, notably with Islam, it's a little bit of turning that on its head because the state exists to grow the religion. <laughs> but the point of the state was to grow the faith. Through holy warfare, if necessary. That's the Alhambra on the left that we'll talk about, and there is on the right, and the sort of back right center of that is the Kaaba, which we'll talk about, of course. And where we are geographically, this is the Mediterranean, here's Egypt, there's Persia. There's Anatolia, Asia Minor, or Turkey. Here's Greece, Italy, the Levant here. Now, this is the Arabian Peninsula, and much of that is desert, but the, the people of the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula are known as Arabs. That is in their ethnicity. Ethnically, they are Arab. They are a Semitic people, so they are of similar origin to many of the peoples that we've seen before uh, from Ethiopians to the Israelites. Now that region had, uh, in the not too distant past from where we're at, we're in the 6th century CE, the 500s, it had been ruled over for a while by the Romans, going back all the way to the 2nd century BCE, it was a Roman province. But as you know, by the 500s, the Western Roman Empire had collapsed, and the Byzantine Empire did not maintain control of the region. Most people in that region, in the Arabian Peninsula, were what we call Bedouins. The Bedouins were nomadic Arabs who lived in a sort of tribal society with tribes that were often, with tribes that were like uh, tied together by familial relationships that were very much in competition with one another uh, for grazing land, which was scarce, for access to wells, water, which is obviously important when you live in a desert region, for controlling the many trade routes that crossed the region that you can see in the map up there. And they had sheikhs, S-H-E-I-K-S, sheikhs who were elected by councils of elders to lead the tribes often at war with one another. They were instrumental in the caravan trade through the region, uh, for they had domesticated the camel. The camel's the pack animal that can withstand the heat and dryness of the desert, for it can store water and go for long periods without it. And that caravan trade becomes a useful alternative in the region, especially given there were times when the Byzantine Empire was at war with um, Sassanid Persia. And that made these overland routes here untenable, as well as if there were war at sea, the uh, Red Sea or Persian Gulf trading routes. And so to have this sort of third option of trade through the Arabian desert was useful, and the Bedouins made the best of that. Uh, 
for all of their tribal warfare, they do share a polytheistic religion that is animistic. And I, can't, I think we've discussed what that means in here. I don't know for sure. But an animistic religion would see that uh, the things of the earth, like trees and rivers and whatnot, were thought to have spirits of some sort. You know, not unlike living human beings. Uh, and I, it is polytheistic, so a number of different gods associated with you know, forces of nature. But there was, notably, a supreme god in the Bedouin religion, and that was Allah. These tribes believed that each tribe had a sacred stone associated with that tribe. And the stone that had been housed in a small structure in Mecca, known as the Kaaba, was thought to be especially sacred. The Kaaba just means the cube, and the cube is the structure that houses this most sacred of stones, which was thought to have fallen from the sky and been encased in that cube or Kaaba by none other than Abraham. That is the same Abraham who is the patriarch of the Hebrews and the Jewish people and who is held as a prophet also uh, by the Christians. So this is the connection to those monotheistic religions. Now, around the time of the birth of the prophet Muhammad, it's important to note that there was a growing rift or divide between the Bedouin tribes in the desert proper and a class of wealthier merchant families who were settled in the cities along the coast who didn't sort of live their life actually uh, in, in nomadic fashion as the Bedouins of the actual desert did. And these merchant families are making quite a lot of money off of this trade, while sort of the, the Bedouins in the desert proper are doing a lot of the legwork. And Muhammad is actually born in Mecca in 570 to such a merchant family. He was orphaned and raised by his uncle, who happened to be the head of his clan. And so he's a man who's born into a family of wealth and importance and power, who only increases in stature when he marries a relatively wealthy widow, who is a caravan manager herself named Khadijah. What's interesting about Muhammad is he understood that there was that growing rift between the Bedouin tribes in the desert and the wealthier elites in the cities to whom he had been born, and he felt like he had gone away from the true Bedouin values of honesty and generosity. And he starts wandering in the hills to meditate and think upon this and think about ways to bring those values back. And in a cave high in those hills, he supposedly has visions of the angel Gabriel who brings him revelations from Allah or God. Gabriel reveals Allah's message supposedly to Muhammad, instructing him to go and preach the word of God, thereby making him the messenger. Him being Muhammad, the messenger. So Muhammad believed that Allah, or God, had revealed himself only partly to Abraham, and then to Moses, and then to Jesus. But that the Jews and the Christians, not unlike those Bedouin elites, had gone away from the true teachings and had gone astray, if you will. And now the final revelations were coming to him. And they are eventually written down these revelations, and assembled after his death to become the holy book of Islam, the Quran. Written in language that reflects 
the sort of oral tradition of the Bedouins, which was very poetic and often described scenes of, of great beauty and luster as if, um, are, are often associated with, say, oases. An oasis is a place in the desert of great uh, vegetation and water. And that's how the Quran describes paradise or heaven. And so you can see in the language of the Quran a reflection of sort of the Bedouin oral poetic tradition. Quran, by the way, means recitation. It establishes guidelines for the followers of Allah, those who would submit to Him. In fact, the word, the name Islam, means submission. And those who would submit to God or Allah are known as Muslims. Notably, they would consider Jews and Christians to be uh, what they would call people of the book. Dimmies, if you will. Uh, followers of scripture in the same general tradition. The Torah for Jews, the first parts of the Old Testament for Christians and large parts of the, the beginnings of the Quran are essentially the same stories, the same traditions, the same book, more or less. The Muhammad, though, starts preaching his message there to the residents of Mecca, per Gabriel's command, attacking traditional beliefs, attacking what he saw as societal corruption, speaking of the possibility of, of submission to the one true God, Allah, condemning all the other gods as false gods, talking about submitting to God being the pathway to an oasis-like paradise that is heaven, or in the alternative, eternal damnation. That's all pretty disturbing and frightening to the people of Mecca. And uh, Muhammad does not do a very good job as the messenger or recruiter, if you will, in the first three years or so. Uh, and in fact, he is seen as deeply alarming to the elites of Mecca, uh, who would in fact very much prefer to get rid of him. And he only has about 30 followers at that time. And they're persecuted. And eventually his uncle and his wife Khadija will be killed. A fate which probably he too would have met had he not up and left. In 622, he and his followers undertake what becomes known as the Hijra, or the Hijra. This is the flight from Mecca to the city at the time known as Yathrib to the north to be known henceforth or thenceforth as Medina or the city of the prophet. So Mecca, by the way, is here. See where the trade routes all come together. And to the north is or Yathrib, which will now be known as Medina. There, Muhammad has a lot more success in building his following. And what he will do, in effect, is build not just a following of believers, but an army of believers. And he will also build the first Ummah. That's not even remotely close. Almost. Almost. Close enough for respectability. Uh, the first UMMA, UMA, that's a community of believers, people who are brought together by their common faith. UMMA, UMA. This is important because they're not brought together by tribe. This would bring people together across tribal lines, in fact. And people could envision a much greater Uma where perhaps the old tribe loyalties and therefore, very importantly, tribal warfare could maybe be
be something of a bygone era. It could go away. If you, if you live in that tribal society, it's hard to envision beyond one tribe conquering all the other ones, unity for a people. It's sort of tribal in perpetuity until Muhammad comes along and introduces this idea of an Umar community of believers that could erase tribal lines. If only he could either convince or force others to convert. We'll see. So, let me see, I might make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Yeah. So, in 630, or 627, I'm sorry, he had built enough of a following and an army of followers, literally, that he figured he could march back to Mecca. Perhaps defeat any army that the Meccans could raise. And it took him three years of besieging the city to do it, but do it he does. And when he does, in 630, he goes straight to the Kaaba, destroys all of the traditional idols to the many gods, leaves the stone in the Kaaba and declares, in fact, the Kaaba a sacred site in Islam, Commanding his followers to always face it when they pray. This is a quite literally what we would call an iconoclastic move to go in there and destroy all of these idols. Um, it's not dissimilar to actions taken by previous prophets before, including Jesus, to say, this is my forceful message to you that above all, I want you to understand there is only one God, and that is God, or Allah. And that is one of the basic tenets or pillars of Islam. Um, this shows you the growth of territory under control of the Muslims. Look what Muhammad built or grew even in his own time, his own lifetime. Majority of the Western Arabian Peninsula with its humble beginnings here in Medina followed by Mecca and branching out from there. And you can see, we'll maybe come back to this, uh, territory added by later rulers. And eventually, as I said, stretching all the way from nearly France, through Persia, and up into Europe. There is the Kaaba. You see that the it's now in the present day nation state of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudis have built incredible uh, skyscrapers and all kinds of things in the immediate vicinity of it. Um, one of the, the pillars of Islam is also that Muslims should, at some point in their life, if they're at all capable, undertake a pilgrimage to Mecca and to visit the Kaaba. It's one of the things that you should do. And so there are, of course, millions of Muslims around the world every single year, although it's been interesting during the COVID pandemic, but every single year you have you know, millions of people who visit the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which is a huge boon to the economy of Mecca and Saudi Arabia. These people have to stay somewhere and they eat places and so on. Which is doubly interesting because for the Bedouins before Muhammad, the Kaaba was a site that was very instrumental in trade. Because you couldn't go into this area armed, no weapons. It's a sacred site. And so it was a place where tribal uh, rivalries wouldn't lead to you know, fighting. Because everybody's there, no arms. You're there you know, to, to worship at the Kaaba, to the many gods. And you can make trade deals while you're there. And so trade flourished. One of the reasons why Muhammad was such a threat, they're like, dude, this is a trade city, and your, your radical ideas are going to disrupt that. Well, now Muhammad controls it. In any case, it's just very impressive <laughs> what the Saudis have built there. Of course, the... Saudi ruling family has billions and billions of dollars in oil revenue money. 
and so they can do these things irrespective of trade in Mecca. There's Jeddah, a very big city on the coast. Starbucks, of course. Oh, wow. That's obviously under construction at the time. There's what we were seeing. There's, I forget what they call that. That's a, that is a, it actually looks not quite as tall as it is because of the width of, of it and the other buildings surrounding it. There's the Kaaba, the uh, skyscraper complex in the background. Pretty cool. Not, uh, not a lot of women there, huh? So the basic tenets or core sets of beliefs of Islam well number one the principle of monotheism and we talk about the five pillars of Islam the very first one is there is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger monotheism is the core tenet of Islam and those who, as I said, would submit to the one true God, Allah, are known as Muslims. Who are to follow those five pillars, as I said, the first of which is the principle of monotheism itself. There is no God but God, Muhammad is his prophet. The next would be to pray five times a day facing the city of Mecca and the Kaaba. So if you're Muslim and your sense of direction is bad, you need to figure out you know, which direction is Mecca. We would, you know, we would here want to figure out you know, what is a west or east southeast from here, rather. Sorry. The next would be to observe each year Ramadan, a period of time in the Muslim calendar where followers are to fast from dawn to sunset, that is to not eat, and to engage in more prayer than usual during that time, and to perform more than usual good deeds and charity. And this typically falls somewhere in May or June. So in addition to your normal five prayers a day and public prayer on Friday, you would want to pray even more while also fasting and while also trying to be even more charitable and generous, even more thoughtful and engaged in deep thinking and, and good deeds during Ramadan. As I mentioned earlier, another pillar would be that at some point in your life, at least once, you need to make the Hajj. The pilgrimage to the Kaaba in Mecca. And then finally, Islam has in it an element of uh, social justice, if you will, in that one of the core tenets of the five pillars is what they would have called giving alms to the poor. Providing from what you have to those less fortunate to help lift them up core component of the Islamic religion. And your reward for following these and for submitting to God is paradise or heaven. As I said, described in the poetic language of the Quran as a sort of desert oasis. 
Now there are, in, there is in the Quran and also um, another of the sacred uh, books of Islam, the Hadith, ruminations on the Quran, uh, laws set out and later interpreted by Muslim scholars after Muhammad's death, uh, and, and therefore sort of open to that sort of in, in interpretation and, and ranging in severity and scope depending on when and where you are, but a, a set of, of principles that lay out what could become then civil law by religious principle, and this is known as Sharia law. And there are certain prohibitions within Sharia law, like you, not, you can't eat pork. The meat has to be prepared a certain way, as in what the, the Jewish people call kosher, the Muslims call halal. Uh, you are not, not to drink alcohol. Uh, dishonesty is forbidden. Arranged marriages are forbidden, and so on. Um, depending again on when and where we are looking, this could also be uh, quite misogynistic. You notice there weren't a lot of women there at, around the Kaaba. And in Saudi Arabia, within the last, I think, you know, five or 10 years, women just got the right to drive automobiles. And certain parts of what Muhammad had said that were written down in the Quran, like women in the presence of men should be behind the veil, get interpreted later by scholars to mean anything from women should have a hijab, very simple head covering, to in more severe Islamic societies, governments decreeing women had to be covered head to foot entirely in the burqa and even with the eyes with a veil over. And their rights could be severely restricted and so on. Again, this depends on when and where you are. There are other Islamic societies and countries uh, that are uh, far more progressive than that and don't follow those kind of interpretations of Sharia law. So it is uh, quite variable. Remember what I said at the onset about Islam and the state. The state had always existed to grow the faith. And the early leaders of Islam are simultaneously religious leaders and the leaders of the state. And there's no separation between political or religious authority, or civil or religious authority, you might say. But who follows Muhammad, though? Well, Muslims had never agreed upon a successor to Muhammad as the leader of the community and the faith, that is, as the, of who will be the caliph or caliph. That is the defender of the faith, the simultaneously the leader of the state and the leader of the faith. His followers select upon his death his father-in-law, a wealthy Medina merchant known as Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr will oversee the expansion of the Arab Islamic State in the Middle East through the waging of the jihad. Jihad means holy war. It actually could have a couple of different meanings, uh, fundamentally speaking. It can mean the, the war that one would wage within oneself to be, to submit to the will of Allah or God and to be a good Muslim. But it could also and did also mean the holy war for the growth of the faith to spread the Islamic faith. And certainly Abu Bakr was successful in doing that. The Muslims drive the Byzantines out of Syria in 640. They conquer the entire Sassanid Persian Empire to the east by 650, around which time they also conquered Egypt to the west. And so if you look at that map, you see in the dark reddish-orange what 
was controlled by the Arab Muslims in Muhammad's own time, and then under Abu Bakr, look where it goes. Up into Syria, nearly into Anatolia, into up to the Caucasus, all throughout Persia, across Egypt, all the way to Tunisia. The Arab Muslims were able to take advantage of the fact that the Byzantine Empire is weakened at that time, as were the Persians by the war between those two empires. It weakened one another. And there was also an outbreak of plague in the Byzantine Empire at that time. And in fact, all throughout Europe. Along with a really interesting ecological disaster that I won't get into unless we have extra time at the end. Now think too, they had the motivation here to dominate all the trade routes throughout that region. Remember the early map we looked at when I said, here are the trade routes which are not super viable when the Byzantine Empire and Persian Empire are at each other's throat. And so that made the ones through the desert that the Bedouins controlled sometimes preferable. Well, what if the Arab Muslims controlled all of those trade routes? Uh, and by the time of the death of Abu Bakr and a couple of caliphs after him, that, that's what they have achieved. So that was a profound motivation for them. Also, um, needless to say, the Bedouins turn out to be very adept horseback warriors, having grown up generations of horseback warriors at war with one another in tribal warfare. They had brilliant generalship and a highly motivated army that believed, by the way, as an Uma, a community of faith and followers who had submitted to Allah, the one true God, that death and jihad in the battle to spread the faith equaled martyrdom, equaled um, heaven, eternal peace, eternal satisfaction, eternal glory. What's interesting is that at this time, once peoples from Egypt to Persia to Syria, once they were conquered by the Arab Muslims, Muslim rule was incredibly tolerant. Uh, I mentioned this idea of demis, or people of the books, the Jews and Christians were allowed to practice their faith as long as they paid a tax, and if they, the burden of the tax was too much or they didn't want to pay it, they could simply convert to Islam. So you convert, you don't have to pay the tax, you serve in the army, or if you don't want to have anything to do with that, you want to keep uh, your version of the faith, then so be it, but you just have to pay the tax. Which would then exclude you also from military service. The, the army was an army of believers. They also often left local sort of rule to locals to administrate. So there's a concept of sort of home rule, if you will. And as it turns out, a lot of those local people, uh, particularly there in the Levant, like in Syria, uh, they judged this, uh, or to the east in the Fertile Crescent, uh, to be preferable to Byzantine or Persian rule. And were quite welcoming to the change. Now, some of Muhammad's followers had never agreed with the selection of Abu Bakr as the caliph to succeed Muhammad. They had supported instead Muhammad's cousin, so his blood relative opposed to his father-in-law, uh, his cousin Ali. His candidacy had been ignored by uh, those with the most power and influence and was again upon the death of Abu Bakr when the caliph ship, if you will, passed to Umar and Uthman. Now, Uthman, though, was assassinated in 656. So the fourth caliph was assassinated, and Ali finally becomes caliph himself, but some believe that Ali had Uthman murdered. 
in order to insert himself. And so, importantly, Ali himself is assassinated, believed to be responsible for the murder of Uthman. And eventually his second son, Hussein, who had also disputed the legitimacy of Abu Bakr and therefore after him Umar and Uthman, incited a revolt with the inspiration being that Ali had been martyred. He was a martyr for the true succession and the way things should have been. And that to honor that martyrdom and seek justice, they needed to revolt against the caliph who replaced Ali. Now, Hussein's revolt, the known of, of revolt of the, the Shia Ali, the followers of Ali, or the Shiites, was unsuccessful. Hussein himself dies in battle in 680. But his followers continue along a separate path. They will be known as the Shiites. And those who instead follow what they feel like are the rightful caliphs, the, those who view themselves who following the tradition of Muhammad himself, the, the prophet, and then subsequently Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, those are the followers of the tradition known as Sunnis. From that day forth until the present day, there are two sort of camps within Islam. There is Sunni Islam and there is Shia or Shiite Islam. And initially, these two factions didn't have a whole lot of differences sort of theologically uh, in terms of what they believed or how they believed you should follow or practice the faith. It was simply this succession dispute and the idea of the martyrdom of Ali that led to the split. Now, over time, they do take on some different vestiges in terms of tradition and what is allowed or encouraged and so on. And the Sunnis are the more traditional branch. But there are nation states today that loathe one another because some are Shiite nations and some are Sunni. For example, Saudi Arabia is a Sunni nation and Iran is a Shiite nation. And those are the two really power brokers of the Muslim world and they do not like each other at all. They are in fact at present waging a proxy war on the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. So, where did that leave us? Um, after the martyrdom of Ali, Muawiyah becomes caliph, and succession after Muawiyah becomes hereditary ushering in the period of the Umayyad dynasty or caliphate. The capital of this caliphate will be Damascus in Syria. And the Umayyads start expanding the empire to the east and to the west. They defeated the Berbers in North Africa, extending Arab Muslim rule all the way across North Africa to Morocco. They take certain islands to the north in the Mediterranean. They even cross the Strait of Gibraltar onto and conquering large portions of the Iberian Peninsula, what's now Spain, taking advantage of a weakened Visigothic kingdom there. They will, in fact, if you look at the map, take the vast majority of the Iberian Peninsula, including what's today Portugal. They very nearly were able to successfully cross the Pyrenees Mountains and to take Gaul or France and were only stopped in 732 at the Battle of Tours with an army under the command of Charles the Hammer Martel. The Arab horsemen, had, uh, has been said, finally met their match in the form of Frankish infantry. 
That said, the Arab Muslims, the Umayyads, had also built a powerful navy rivaling in the Mediterranean that of the Byzantine Empire and had set their sights around that same time on the Byzantine capital of Constantinople. That said, the Byzantines had devised uh, something known to history as Greek fire, probably a combination of petroleum and quicklime and sulfur that would burn on water, <laughs> and that they launched over the walls of Constantinople and onto the Umayyad fleet, which burns it and destroys it and saves the city of Constantinople. In 750, the decadence of some of the late Umayyad rulers leads to a revolt led by an individual known as Abu al-Abbas, who was able to overthrow the Abbasid dynasty in 750 and establish his own dynasty, because he is Abu al-Abbas, known as the Abbasid dynasty, or Caliphate, which will bring us into the 13th century. The Abbasids were able to break down what had been a pretty sharp distinction up to that point between Arab and non-Arab Muslims, allowing non-Arab Muslims in the lands they conquered to hold high office, and opening up at the same time Islamic culture to influences from the occupied territories from Persia to North Africa to Iberia. And they permitted intermarriage between Arabs and non-Arabs in the occupied land. Which actually leads to more people considering themselves Arab. They moved the capital in 762 to Baghdad, in modern day Iraq. Baghdad under the Abbasids becomes a true world class city. You know it holds a strategic position on the Tigris River in the Fertile Crescent. It is a sort of centralized location for trade going through the Middle East, coming into the Persian Gulf from farther east and going on to the west, right in the smack middle of the caravan routes running east and west. And the Abbasid Caliphs actually sponsor the uh, opening of a, uh, a house of wisdom, essentially a university, where they funded uh, astronomical observatories and the development of uh, sophisticated mathematics from algebra to trigonometry and uh, engineering and early medicine. And the collection of even European texts at a time when Europe was squarely in the middle of what we call the Dark Ages, or the medieval period. It was mired in a period of decline in which learning and culture were not advancing. That was all kept alive by Muslim scholars at Baghdad, where they built vast libraries, including numerous Greek texts, which would later be rediscovered by European scholars and artists as part of the Renaissance. So Baghdad, as I mentioned, is also the center of what becomes a vast trading network connecting East and West, Africa and Europe, India and China. Paper comes in from China, rice and sugar and cotton from India and Southeast Asia. And then from Europe headed east, glass and wine and indigo and silver. Consider too the city of Cordoba over here in the Iberian Peninsula in modern day Spain. Also at the same time a world class city.
that would put to shame any other city in Europe at that time, again, with Europe languishing in the Dark Ages. And you have it in Cordoba, this cosmopolitan city with streetlights and paved roads and hospitals and libraries and running water and an incredibly majestic and beautiful mosque that would later be the inspiration for dozens of Gothic European cathedrals, which it is today a cathedral, to which I have, uh, I have been. I have um, actually in a wedding in that cathedral in Cordoba. A friend of mine lives there, got married there. And it is incredibly beautiful and awe-inspiring. See, you want, our, our West, uh, we want to say Cordoba, but notice the accent mark on the first O. Cordoba. Mesquita. You can get a good view somewhere of La Mesquita. Yeah, right up on the head and wall, that's not very helpful. Yeah, it's lost it somewhere. There we go. That's one view. It's a, it's a pretty vast structure, as you can see. That's not, well now we're getting inside of it, which is not what I intended, but anyway. Um, this. Arches, vaults, flying buttresses, all would become key elements in Gothic architecture. Arabic script. Obviously, cathedral now, Spain is a Christian nation. Which is interesting because in the city now known as Istanbul, you have what originally was a cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, which is now a mosque, because that city changed hands in the opposite direction, so. Anyway, uh, pretty elaborate, pretty incredible, and a sign of the sort of grandeur of the Abbasid dynasty there um, in the heart of Europe. Now, this Typical story, some of the later caliphs begin to rule autocratically, leading more lavish lifestyles as had the late caliphs of the Umayyads. They become less spiritual leaders and more like kings. It, of course, is a hereditary monarchy, and you never know when you're going to get someone who is uh, corrupt or what we might call a profligate, that is somebody who just wants the pleasures of the palace, has no interest in ruling, and certainly not benevolently. And what could sometimes be the case is that uh, viziers, uh, upper level administrators, could become more powerful than the caliph himself, who might be disregarding you know, the fundamental prohibitions in Islam. He might be keeping concubines for his own personal pleasure or uh, imbibing alcohol on the regular or what have you. And Predictably, the Abbasids enter a period of decline, which would include the rise to prominence of certain of those non-Arab peoples, particularly Persians and Turks, in the military and in the bureaucracy. And then you add to that a strange ecological um, factor in the, the over-silting of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and adjacent canals, which make them temporarily impassable leading to food shortages. And you start to see the fracturing of the empire on its outskirts around 900. 
They lose control of Morocco in northwestern Africa. They lose control of Egypt to a Shiite faction known as the Fatimids in 973. And then come the Celtic Turks. We talked about the Xiongnu in North Central Asia, who eventually have built an empire in that part of the world that when it collapses leads to the outmigration of all the Turkish speaking peoples, in particular to the West, and some of those peoples converted to Islam in the process, and that includes the Seljuk Turks, who for a while worked as mercenaries for the Abbasids, warriors for pay or by hire. Because like other Turks from Central Asia, from the steppe, they excelled at horseback warfare and archery. But they begin to consider their own self-interest, and in the uh, 1000s, they turn on the Abbasids and start chipping away at and controlling for their own purposes Abbasid territory. They even capture the capital of Baghdad in 1055. The Seljuk Turkish commander is the first, to, the first to take the title of Sultan, holder of power. The new political and military ruler. And the Sultan would gradually accumulate power as the Abbasid Caliphs faded away as simply religious figureheads. The Turks, though, bring much needed stability. They quell a brewing conflict between Sunnis and Shiites in the realms. It was a revitalization of Islamic law. They begin to reconstitute the empire by invading Egypt and by taking Anatolia or Turkey away from the Byzantine Empire. They, in fact, become an existential threat to the Byzantine Empire, which views them as barbarians and oppressors. And at one point, the Byzantine emperor tells the kings of Western Europe that the Seljuk Turks are destroying shrines in the Holy Land. Now, the Fatimid Caliph, uh, Al-Hakim, did destroy the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, but beyond that, there was not any sort of systematic destruction of Christian shrines in the Holy Land or oppression of Christian peoples. As you know, these uh, Muslim caliphates had, had been relatively tolerant of Jews and Christians. But the Byzantine Empire is worried about his own ass and essentially makes up a bunch of bullshit about what the Turks are doing in the Holy Land to recruit from those kings of Central and Western Europe armies to come and help the Byzantine Empire in their war with the Celtic Turks. And thus we have the Crusades. Beginning in 1096, Christian forces sent raiders into the Middle East to attack the Muslim territories to perhaps take and hold some of that territory. So the first crusade um, yields some territory for the Christians, uh, including Antioch, one ancient uh, city important to Christendom, one of the sites of the, of the first uh, bishoprics in early Christianity. They're able to take territory through the Levant and into the Sinai. The Muslims, as it turned out, were unprepared for dealing with the armored cavalry that the European Christian knights come with. But then we have Saladin. Saladin is actually a Sunni Kurd. The Kurds are from an area that's situated between Anatolia or Turkey and modern day Iraq. But he rises up to a, a position of leadership that sees him realign um, Fatimid Egypt with uh, the Abbasids and the, the Turks. 
essentially bringing an end to Fatiman self-rule in Egypt, reintegrating that territory. And from there, he's able to raise a resistance in 1169 and able to invade and uh, sack Christian-controlled Jerusalem. Remember, the Christians in the First Crusade had taken a good amount of the Holy Land from Antioch all the way down to uh, the Sinai. This is in 1187, if you're counting. Now, Christian forces would return in a renewed crusade a few years later, but that one turned out to be unsuccessful. In fact, they never again achieved the success of the first crusade, and some of the later ones are abject disasters, as we'll see in later lectures. And the last Christian stronghold at Acre falls in 1291. Meanwhile, though, a much more destructive force was rising in the east, the Mongols, a pastoral people who migrate out of the Gobi Desert to the northwest of China in the 1100s, yet another group of nomadic horseback warrior archers, in this case under the leadership of Genghis Khan, who is able to conquer China. So you know you have a credible threat coming when the people headed your way have conquered China. More on that later. Genghis Khan's sons, Hulegu and Kubla Khan, are able to conquer Persia and then eventually much of the Muslim Middle East. Now, the Mongols were not Muslims. This is not as of the arrival of the Seljuk Turks who had converted, at least not at first. And they treated their conquered populations quite badly. The, the Mongols are known for brutal massacres of populations and the deliberate destruction of the countryside that lead to famines that result in the deaths of even more people. It has been argued that what the Mongols were engaged in in certain areas was borderline genocide. Destroying cities, destroying irrigation works, and so on. Systematic murder and torture of the civilian population. They got as far as uh, Russia in the north and down here where we are as far as Egypt, where they were finally defeated by a Turkish military class of former slaves who had risen to the position of rulership in Egypt. This is the Mamluks who had in fact overthrown the government of Saladin. Now eventually the Mongol rulers in the Middle East begin to assimilate. They do eventually convert to Islam, but their empire begins to break apart. The Mongols overstretch their capabilities, geographically speaking, and the empire that Genghis and his sons built does not last very long. Not unlike we saw with Alexander, it breaks up into what were known as Khanates similar to the Hellenistic kingdoms. The Middle East will for a time be one of those continents. Meanwhile, though, a vestige of Muslim rule in the West, in Europe proper, was uh, still going. I, I stopped short of saying going strong, but uh, Muslim princes, rulers, had held on to much of the Iberian Peninsula. Even when Abbasid rule began to recede in North Africa. And with the decline of Baghdad, this becomes the pinnacle of Islamic culture and, and knowledge and civilization, and would continue to be so until that passes probably to, to Cairo in Egypt. An Umayyad prince there had established himself as the ruler in 750, Abd al-Rahman, you don't need to know the name, it's not up there. This is where the Muslim armies had defeated the Visigoths and taken control of most of the Iberian Peninsula. And that becomes the Principality of Al-Andalus, which part, the southern part of Spain is known still today as Andalusia. The capital is Cordoba, which I mentioned earlier, the great cosmopolitan city of the Western Muslim Empire. 
Jews proclaimed themselves to be an independent caliphate upon the fall of Baghdad. And they sit there at the end of a massive trade network. And it is through Al-Andalus that things such as cotton, sugar, olives, and dates are introduced to Western Europe via Muslim Al-Andalus or Spain. Beyond just Cordoba, cities like Sevilla and Toledo thrive as artistic and intellectual centers. Centers of learning in the fields of medicine and astronomy and mathematics and philosophy with great libraries that become important centers of learning. But Christian kingdoms to the north begin to take a long look to the south at these outsiders, these others, these non-Christians. And around 1,000, you begin to see Christian armies invading the Iberian Peninsula and chipping away at the territory held by these Muslim rulers. Toledo in the center of Spain is taken in 1085. That would be, Toledo is roughly, also a city I've been to, roughly in here. Al-Andalus, the rulers of thereof, actually call on a people to the south, Berbers from Morocco, known as the Almoravids, who do indeed come supposedly to help, but end up actually overthrowing the rulers of Al-Andalus and taking over for themselves. And that's important because they rule with a much more heavy hand. Uh, they, they put an end to religious toleration. Um, there is not as much support for the intellectual movement that you see in, from Cordoba to Sevilla. Which makes them even more of a target, therefore, for Christian kingdoms to the north. And there, ultimately, the Almoravids are unable to, to, to stop the advance of the Christians. And the Pope at the time calls for a new sort of Western crusade in Spain. But to drive, as they were trying to drive the Muslims out of the Holy Land in the east and the Levant, the Pope calls for driving Muslims out of what had been Christian realms there in the west. This western crusade becomes known as the Reconquista, the Reconquest. And then he the call over the course of the early uh, 1200s into the 1300s, Christian armies steadily advanced for 200 years until the late 1400s, there was one last holdout. One last Muslim prince who holds a incredible and heavily fortified castle and palace that sits on a hilltop above the city of Granada down here. That palace and castle complex is known as the Alhambra, which is pictured there. That is the last holdout. And it will be the two rulers of Castilla and Aragon, kingdoms that come together upon the marriage of Fernando and Isabella, to become the kingdom of Spain. It will be those two that set their sights on driving this last Muslim ruler out of what was then Spain, which will occur in 1492 at the very same moment that those two were sponsoring uh, a, a, an Italian seafarer named Christopher Columbus who would sail west in an attempt to get to the East Indies and China and India, which he would not have achieved and would have in fact died along with all of his crew in the middle of the open ocean had there not been two giant continents in the way that none of these people knew existed, which he stumbles upon at the very same time Fernando and Isabella's armies are driving the last Nasser dynasty prince out of Granada. So trying to tie it all together, trying to build some bridges to where we're going to go. We're, of course, going to bounce back over to China, where we'll have to deal there with the Mongols. Uh, eventually, we will pivot back to Europe, where, of course, we'll talk again about the Crusades. We'll talk extensively about the Middle Ages and Byzantium. 
and eventually get to the quote unquote discovery of the new world. And so, questions about any of that? It occurs to me, I threw a lot of names out there, but you know if they're not on the PowerPoint, I'm not going to ask you to give them back to me. So, uh, if you missed something, don't worry about it. <laughs>